Let's okay. Go. Okay, perfect. So let's uh, let's start to make sure to we make the most of our time together. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, myself, uh, we have uh, Fergal O'Brien, um, who is our assistant for graduate studies, and a bunch of our great team at the Graduate of Professional Studies uh, helping us here today. Um, so we'll just start with a little bit of a, of a welcome um, and kind of talk a little bit about the course. I have a few slides to talk, share a little bit about what we do, a little bit about work in organizational psychology, behavior more generally. So I'll talk a little bit about the course itself. Then we have one of our fantastic graduates, uh, Mr. Adam Burke, who's going to talk to you a little bit about his experience and his impressions and how we experienced the course. Um, then we're going to have some time for some Q&A. So that's our general plan for the day. So I'll, I'll start and then if you have any questions or anything, feel free to put them in, in the chat. And obviously, like I said, we'll have time at the end to answer any questions. So some of the things that we've seen a lot lately are things like the great resignation, quiet quitting, um, some of the dilemmas that organizations have nowadays is how to bring people back um, and how to manage hybrid working. So there have been a lot of changes in how we work that have been going on for quite a few years, but COVID has really accelerated them, both in terms of how people experience work, how we think about work, what we want to get out of work, and how organizations manage, right, the work and people coming into the office. And um, hopefully this wouldn't scare you too much, but over our lifetime, we spend about 9,000 days at work. That's quite a lot. That means that workplaces matter. It's important that we create workplaces and spaces that people don't only you know, come to work, get paid, that's important. But because we spend so much time at work, we want to create organizations that allow people to thrive. And when we talk about thriving, there's a lot of literature there that we're not going to talk about. We can talk about it next year in the course. But we're talking about enjoying positive outcomes, both for individual employees, positive outcomes like health, attitudes, engagement, and also performance. So in terms of the organization's perspective, when people thrive at work, they do well, they perform better. And so it's a win-win situation all around. And this would be the ideal workplace, an organization that is set in a way that employee can thrive and enjoy work and be productive and contributing to the organization. And what we do, organizational psychologists and behaviorists, and I'm going to use these two words interchangeably, and I'll talk a bit about the core structure and the psychology behavior element of it. But just kind of now in general is what we do. Our goal is to help organizations and individuals thrive, is to do the research and the practical work that would give organizations the tools and the knowledge that they need to create such organizations. And basically what it means when we talk about organizational psychology or organizational behavior is application of psychological principles and behavioral principles in general, theory and research to the work setting. And what we see more and more in recent years, it's not just what happens when we are at work, but what happens before we come to work and after we leave work and how all of that kind of ties into our experience at work. And when we look at the kind of components of what organizational work in organizational psychology is. We're talking about three broad domains, organizational psychology, work psychology, and personnel psychology. And specifically things like, if you look at personnel psychology, we're talking about recruitment, selection of people to jobs, learning and development throughout their lifespan in the organization, managing performance. Work psychology is you know, how we get good performance from people, issues of motivation, well-being, mental health, really big issues that have definitely taken much more center stage since COVID. And think about it, it's all new forms of work, the gig economy, entrepreneurship, um, you know, all of that changes that are coming, taking kind of an organizational perspective as well as an individual. What does that all mean for people and organizations? And then organizational psychology talks about teams, diversity, leadership, climate, culture. So all these kind of more system or macro factors that then fit into those environments. So these are the three components and I'll go back to this image when we talk about what we do in the course and how we touch upon all these three different subfields. So working organizational psychologists and behaviorists have a lot of different 
roles within organizations, diagnosing issues, being change agents, advising, managing, coaching, training, advocating, consulting, a lot of different things that we do, which basically kind of put our job as a bit of like we have two hats. We come from and, and of course, itself comes from a psychology perspective, thinking about individuals, but at the same time, we have to think about the organization and the macro level. So we have these two hats that we constantly uh, kind of wear and have to consider. Um, what kind of job titles uh, organizational psychologists, work organizational psychologists and behaviors have? So organizational psychologists, senior consultants or consultants, recruitment consultants, business analysts, uh, analysts, human resource specialists, talent manager, performance coach, and more and more and more job titles. It's a very broad field. And what we see, I think, recently is that there are more and more kind of niches and things that are emerging within that field. So there's you're going to get a very broad education in the field, and then you're going to find where you fit in and which direction interests you. Um, and before I talk more specifically about who we are, just kind of a bit of example. So our graduates uh, that graduate with the degree MSc in work psychology or organizational work behavior work in a variety of different organizations, both in Ireland and abroad. Um, we have an international kind of student body. So some of them stay in Ireland, some of them go back. Um, private companies like Accenture, consulting, Deloitte, um, and then also more um, public organizations like the HSC, the health um, executive here. So uh, those of you who are not from Ireland, that's kind of like the health system. So many kinds of jobs and organizations. So it's a very wide field and area. Um, and this is kind of really on the tip, just the tip of what organizational psychology, organizational behavior is. Um, so a bit about us. So our program sits within the Kemi Business School which is one of the 1% business schools in the world that are triple accredited. That means we, our program has been really examined very well by different accreditation body. The program, it's, program itself is accredited by our relevant professional bodies that I'll mention in, in a minute. Um, but you, we sit within a business school. So we come from a psychological perspective, but we're grounded in the business. We think about the people and the organization. This is something that we um, really take care of doing. Um, we sit in the Department of Work and Employment Studies where we have organizational psychologists, OB people, HR people, industrial relation uh, researcher. So we have a bright, broad variety of experts from related fields to kind of give you different perspectives on what this area is and what does it mean to be uh, a working organizational psychologist or behaviorist. So about the program. So we have two names, but it's one program. Basically, it depends on where your undergraduate degree lies um, in, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a bit. But if you come from an undergraduate degree in psychology, then you can join our organization, work in organizational psychology track. If you don't come from a psychology background, from a business, HR, some other related area, then the behavior track is the one for you. But it is essentially the same program, all our students take the exact same modules, um, do dissertation. Um, so it's all the same. It just depends on your background um, that will determine which track you're on. Um, our program is specifically accredited by the Psychological Society of Ireland for our psychology track and the CIPD for our behavior track. Um, We've been around for quite a while. Our first cohort, as you can see, started in September 2007. We're one of the very first programs in Ireland that were accredited by the PSI, which we're very proud of. Um, it's a full time for this upcoming year. We're offering only the full time one year program. Um, we have a part time program. We won't be offering it next year, but it will come back again in the next next academic year. So academic year 24-25. And our faculty, as I mentioned, um, we have experts in all the different subfield that I outlined before. We are all active researchers and I'll talk about my colleagues, not about myself, but everybody is an excellent teacher and lecturer. Um, and we really pride ourselves in creating a community with our students where we have very open conversations and um, yeah, just a great atmosphere all around. I'm sure Adam will be able to say a bit more about that from his perspective. In terms of core elements of our program, multidisciplinary, behavior, psychology, uh, but it's all with this under, with underlying psychology that we're coming out of. We're evidence-based practice and science practice. So what we talk about are very practical things. We're gonna 
what you're going to do are things you will do at work as psychologists or behaviorists later on. And it all comes from research, from evidence. Um, it's what you do, how you do it in a way that aligns with what we know about um, how people are at work and what is the best way to do that. We have a variety of assessment methods. We have group work, individual assessment to really kind of focus it on, again, those things that you would do, the competencies and skills that you would need later on in your career. Um, I mentioned theoretical and practical focused. Um, and what we strive to do is to develop reflective practitioners that have a really strong foundation in all these areas in theory, research practice, but also have the tools to continue and develop professionally, which is very important. Things change all the time. There are new things coming. And what we strive to create is, or to develop is professionals who are able to seek out all the new information that is coming and continue to develop themselves in, you know, to become better professionals, to have import, have effective impact on the organizations they work with, et cetera. So our learning is encouraged through these three lenses. So coursework, lectures, we have that. Um, we meet twice a week for the full-time program for our modules. And this is kind of the more traditional reading, class discussions, et cetera. Experiential learning is very important for us. As I said, what we do in the classroom and assessments outside of the classroom is very much tied into things that you would need to do, tasks you would need to perform as consultants and psychologists. And the learning from others is really important. I would say that our students learn just as much from their peers as they do for, from us. Um, we have very diverse group of students coming in with different experience and really, you know, have seen and done different things, whether you're straight out of an undergraduate degree, you've been in organizations. If you were in a sports group in a club, those are organizations. So you have something to bring and contribute to other people, um, whether you've been in the workforce or not. So these are three elements that we really very much put a lot of focus on. So very concretely, we have three semesters. Again, it's, this is our full time year. In the autumn and the spring, we have our modules, our core work, organizational personnel psychology um, modules, um, and we have research methods and we have career development modules, which are great and give really practical tools in terms of how to write your CV, interview, assessment center, which is interesting for our students to go through it as you will be looking for a job, but also from our perspective as people who are involved in those processes from the organization perspective. Um, the summer semester is focused on dissertation, which is usually submitted in early August. And outside of semesters, we have psychometric testing training, which uh, gives our students the opportunity to be um, certified by the British Psychological Society in administering ability tests, um, which is very useful and important. And final thing, what are our entry requirements? So again, we have the psychology track and behavior track. Um, so if you come from psychology, you can go into the psychology track. If you don't come from psychology, you can come to the behavior track. And as I said before, they're identical entirely. Just what's going to be on your degree at the end. Um, a requirement is a first or second class level eight honors degree. And if you're coming internationally, an equivalent of that, and I'm sure UL Global will be able to answer any questions about what does that mean and, and what documentation you would need to provide um, for that. If you have a lower um, to, uh, award, so second class, um, we are looking for people who do have some kind of work experience that maybe you didn't do that well academically, but you have the experience. We're very practical area. So it's a lot about that combination of experience and what we learn. Um, so the link is there for our program. You have already seen that in terms of what you need to apply beyond the general UL required documents. Is there a transcript and final award for your degree? If you're still in the process for your last year, then you submit what you have until now and then you bring, you, you'll you get the last of it later on. Your CV and a competency form, uh, which is a specific form that we created as organizational working organization psychologists, we have a very um, systematic um, selection way. So we ask that you complete that competency forms form. It really, the goal of it is to give you some space to kind of bring yourself, your experiences and to show your ability to apply things that you learn and what you know about work into your own experience. So that is very important. And then there's, if you're not coming from an English speaking country, there are the general UL English requirements. 
Um, in terms of our timelines, our applications are due on the 31st of January, 2023 for early admissions. Um, we will only be reviewing admission, your applications after that date. So anything that comes in until then will be reviewed in February and offers will be sent out during February. Uh, late admissions are due on the 31st of March based on available space. Um, and that is for me. This is our email, um, and I'll also put it in the chat. So if you have any questions, any follow-ups or anything, then email us there. And then we have Breed, who is our incredible administrative um, administrator for the course, and she'll be able to either answer a question or direct it to myself or the right person that can provide you the best answer for that. So I'll stop sharing now. I'll hand over to Adam. Um, who has graduated from our course mm -hmm. last year. And I'll hand it over to you, Adam, to just maybe talk a little bit about your experience, what you do, your experience in the course, how the course has kind of contributed to what you do at work outside of the course. And uh, yeah, just about your own experience there. Thank you, Moran. And first of all, I'll vouch for Breed. She was incredible whilst I was <laughs> setting up my own application as well and throughout the course. Um, so hello everyone, my name is Adam Burke. I'm currently the Learning Development Consultant at Allianz Ireland. Um, we're a global organisation, of course, headquartered in Munich, Germany. But we'd have about 650 employees here in Ireland. Before I go into that in a little bit more detail, I want to just go back, if that's OK, to where I was. So I did my degree in psychology. I can't even remember the year, but I was certainly out of school at 18, 19, and I did a degree in psychology. And then I found myself getting into, into the gym. So long story short, I spent about eight or nine years with a global fitness company called Les Mills. I was a trainer. I was looking after teams. I was <clears throat> helping with a program called Body Attack. So lots of international travel, lots of uh, creating content, delivering content quality assessment of other people delivering content. It's something I really, really enjoyed. I was very passionate about the fitness arena as well and motivating people. So you can start to see, uh, you know, themes that I was interested in, facilitation, training, learning and development, motivation. And uh, I was doing well. I was like eight or nine years with this company and you know like other companies i was made redundant and that was like a shock to the system so from doing my degree it was probably 10 years later that i was thinking okay uh i always thought i'd go back to psychology but that was the catalyst for me and i didn't quite go back to the organization psychology more and i went to sports psychology and i found themes that i was interested in i was like okay this could be something leadership and motivation teamwork but for me, it was a very niche market in Ireland, especially. So I was working, I was again facilitating content with a social enterprise company. And um, what I ended up doing with them was a lot of building content around uh, growth mindset, actually. And that was me just crafting kind of my own job. I was like, I kind of want to do this. It felt like it was necessary because we were dealing with a lot of um, young children that young adults who had maybe dropped out of school and you know trying to help them along with CVs so we're starting to move into the career element now and um, so I was looking at growth mindset delivering this we were actually working with Accenture to to bring this across all of Ireland and I came across the UL organization psychology masters and i thought this is it you know it's it's bringing me into organizations it's the themes that i want to look at so that's when i applied actually was through that work the first year of the masters was i believe in lockdown i did a two-year part-time masters i've now three kids i had two kids at the time and the part-time one just really really suited me at the time so the first year was in lockdown um and I took a few notes as you were talking there, Moran, because I think if if people are listening to you, you know, you have the university limerick behind you, but I can vouch for everything that you said. They are great teachers, even through lockdown. The communication was excellent and um, the, the practical experience you get from all of the lectures as well. And when I met up with some of my um, friends from the Masters, that's what we all said. When we started to move into the industry, 
we could almost look back at some of the case studies we were asked to look at or some of the projects we were asked to work on and it was just embedding that into our everyday. Um, when I started taking some notes here as to what the masters has done for me is number one anyone on the call might be thinking that you know you have to spend a bit of money here and for me the way I looked at it was this is an investment and I sold it to my wife as an investment because I was certain that I would get a return on that investment in terms of the salary. So what it did was it, it got me indoors that I would not have got into beforehand. So halfway through the master's, I applied for an organization development role with, um, it's, it's a public sector company called IDA. So IDA would have looked after, and still do, sorry, all of the um, foreign direct investment in Ireland. And Ireland would be considered one of the strongest in terms of foreign direct investment globally. So really, you know, pushing above our weight. It, it got me in the room. It got me the interview. Now, lots of my previous experience helped me in that interview. But certainly the knowledge that I obtained from the masters really gave me credibility and confidence in the interview as well. So it certainly got me in the door. It got me moving into, <clears throat> I think, working more on a strategic level at that stage because it was, you know, had the masters on my CV and I could talk to certain subjects and content um, quite confidently. So within that role, I was working on two major aspects. So there's three major aspects. So one was the, the learning development side of things and looking after the strategy around that. That was kind of in place when I was there. They were doing a good job on that. So that was just about keeping it running. But two of the major projects were uh, looking after their graduate program and really close to my heart was from the very beginning, creating a well-being strategy, which they had never had before. So like most organizations, I think they were doing lots in the well-being space and they thought we're doing a good job here. But what I learned from doing the master's in psychology was, well, we can evaluate this, we can measure it, we can go out there and ask questions and we can get some qualitative data by having focus groups and send surveys out. And, and then I could then present it to the board of management and say, this is where we're at. This is our baseline and be able to tell them step by step how we're going to improve upon that. Uh, I don't think I would have had that knowledge if I hadn't have completed the master's in psychology and, and completed the, the well-being module within that as well. So that was something that was just excellent. Um, when an opportunity with Allianz came up, the only reason I, I kind of, it was a really tough decision and I said this to all my IDA colleagues, but um, within Allianz, what I was joining was our organization development and research team. So now I'm applying for jobs that are within research, within organizations. My boss has a PhD, so I'm sitting down with this guy that, you know, I know is incredibly smart, incredibly well versed in terms of research. Uh, my now colleague is a business anthropologist. So going out and doing qualitative data um, and looking at lean and agile work and future state operating models. And again, I would say that I, I don't think I would have gotten in the room if my CV hadn't got Masters and University of Limerick on it. You know, it has um, a certain thing about it that people are drawn to that, you know, not everybody has. And especially because it's University of Limerick, there's a prestige to that as well. So I'm now, since August of this year, working in the research team under the role of Learning Development Consultant. And I'd say it's almost similar to well-being. There's lots of organizations they have learning and development in there. What we're looking to do and the reason I took the role and why it's so affiliated with the masters is they want me to do research around this. So we're looking at um, how can we implement a Kirkpatrick model of evaluation in terms of learning? So if you don't know what that is, you will because hopefully you'll do the masters, but it's a four step or four level evaluation model of learning. One is, did you enjoy it? So I could ask you, are you enjoying this right now? It's a kind of, you could say one to five scale. 
But at the, the level four, we, we want to show that learning has had a direct impact on uh, the business. So have we increased profit or have we reduced attrition? Have we improved performance as Moran uh, alluded to earlier on in terms of what organization psychologists do? So I think that's incredible to be able to go into the role having just completed the master's and um, gotten the interview, uh, <laughs> somehow passed the interview and then be able to have the credibility and confidence uh, to deliver on that as well. It just wouldn't have happened if I hadn't done this master's. So um, yes, it's an investment, but from a salary perspective, I've seen that return on investment from a, how I feel about myself and the roles I'm doing. I get it back as well because I love what I do. I'm really enjoying it. It's carrying on from what I love doing in the fitness arena as well because I get to motivate people, I get to facilitate uh, sessions, and because I'm working for a company that's embedding it into their strategy, I get to see the results at the end of the day. I think that's all that I had really to chat about, Moran, and probably more benefit to open up to any questions if people have any. Yeah, thank you so much, Adam. Um, and yeah, we're very glad to have Adam here. Is uh, who do we bring? And Adam, you know, you have this experience that before the the course, and um, you know, it's great. You know, it's great to hear about how the course has helped you and you know everything you gained I do, from it. Um, I do have my certs like I have a big bookshelf here but I do have my certs I don't know if you can see those from the no, BPS. No we can't see you. Oh Camera's yeah. Off, I so think. It's, it's the British Psychological Society I've got my occupational personality ability testing certificates beside me here and now I think that was a great addition as well Um because UL is the only university really in Ireland is, I think in Ireland, am I right to say, to, to offer that as well. So that's a huge help. Yeah, thanks, Adam. So Laura, should we open up for any questions or bring in uh, any of the questions that we had from before? Yeah, that's great, Moran. Thank you. And thank you so much, Adam. It was lovely to hear your story, um, which uh, nicely segues to the first question we received. And maybe I'll put this one to Fergal. Um, Fergal, um, Adam returned to education after a number of years to do his master's. One of the questions we had from a person who registered was, you know, what percentage of people, not just on this course, but at the Kemi Business School, um, are not recent graduates from an undergraduate program? Um, that's a, it's a great question and there's no definitive answer in terms of, first of all, what the right route is for anybody. So a lot of people would argue that it's good to go out and experience work and then once you've figured out what you'd like to return. I am not an advocate of that theory. Uh, my own view is if you're lucky enough to be able to continue your postgraduate education straight off the bat from your undergraduate education, I think it's a good time to get your master's qualification. The reason being uh, you have a lot more flexibility in your life at that stage. Um, you are in the study mode. And also, if nothing else, you get your enhanced career, your enhanced earnings at an earlier point in your career as a result of having your master's, as opposed to maybe going out, working for five years and then returning, potentially losing out on a year's earnings or being under pressure in terms of study. In saying that, there's no definitive answer. Now, with respect to the Kemi Business School, it, it varies. Um, so, for example, on business analytics, we have a lot of international students with with many years of work experience. But then on programs like financial services, risk management and insurance, we would see people that would be coming straight out from undergrad going into a deepening role on their particular programs. Now, Moran's program here in terms of work in OB and work in OP has always had a part time variant, which makes that unusual as well. Now, for circumstances that we don't need to talk about here, that variant isn't available this year, so it's going to be full time. So maybe more and you'd like to talk about just generally the class profile, even in the full time cohort in terms yeah. of whether they're returners or people going straight on. Yeah, so like you said, for classically our part timers would have been people that would have been out of education for a while. But actually this year we have four or three of our full timers that are 
you know, have been around, have done work and circumstances in their lives sort of conspire that are now able to do the course full time. It's actually something we really appreciate and we see a lot in the classroom. Um, that contribution of people, you know, Fergal, like you said, good, you know, people going straight out of undergraduate, they're bringing a lot of value there and also people that are coming back. So, you know, if you are kind of returning into education, you're, you're going to have people there. We will have our second year part timers um, in the classroom next year. So we're still going to have that mix um, with this year. I think we had a nearly 50 50 in terms of part timers and full time. So it's definitely we have younger students and we have more mature students that are coming back. And, you know, I think that's one of our strengths, actually, where, you know, each bring their own individual kind of strength into the mix. And really, there's a lot of learning from one another. And I would I would add to that, Laura, just one quick thing is it's it's an interesting dynamic in terms of developing your professional network. I always found particularly with yeah. the younger graduates who are looking for opportunities their professional network is developed with the, the part timers, particularly who are in the industry. And very often I would have thought more and you might know more oh, yeah. about this, but it would literally be almost like that they have a, a talent pipeline in their in their in their classmates. Yeah, so I think Absolutely. that's an unusual dynamic. Yeah. Yeah, our part timers and hire their classmates um, and you know, we have a lot of we have a LinkedIn group just for our graduates and our students, so a lot of and when our graduates then have they're looking for people in their organization, we get the first email about that availability and they do tend to hire more alumni. So absolutely in terms of the network there, 100 percent. That's really fantastic to hear and that covers off, you know, quite a number of questions about, you know, um, what options for career development there are for people, you know, to be in a class of people who are always referring each other is, is such an opportunity. Um, one of the questions here, um, sorry, I'm just going back. Um, the types of roles that people are in, and particularly those who may already um, have an interest in learning and development, what career options are open to, to those individuals on completion? Yeah, of so talk a bit general and I think Adam could probably add to that but yes yeah, so as I said there's within the work and organizational psychology behavior area there's so many different things from kind of more classic HR so we have graduates that work in recruitment we have you know people in the development aspect learning and development career development consulting so there's a lot of different options there because our modules then cover all of the areas. The way we structure the program is based on like, what our professional body sort of outline is what needs to go into this field. So in terms of the knowledge, the skills you gain in the classroom, there's a lot of possibilities there that you kind of get exposed to these new things and then obviously through the networks. But maybe Adam, you can speak more specifically about learning and development as I know we had a specific question about that. Yeah, I can, so I can talk further from my experience as well and um, what we do within Alliance is we have a strategic workforce planning in place at the start of every year. So the reason I mentioned that is it's um, I would work with the, the HR business partners. So the fact that the content within the masters is so broad, it, it enables me to understand kind of a little bit about recruiting. Um, it, it's not my area that I, I want to necessarily go into but it's given me an understanding of it. And when they're talking to me about uh, rec the recruiting aspect or challenges they're facing, then um, I can obviously speak to that from the learning development side of things. For me personally, uh, the masters gave me the opportunity to move away from the facilitation side of things and more onto the strategic side of things. So again, working uh, with the strategic workforce planning aspect, mm working with business anthropologists and um, the leaders of the business essentially to embed it into the into the strategy and then to evaluate it as well, which I think I was probably missing beforehand. It was a case of, hey, I delivered a great session, but actually what's the impact here? And that's the important piece of the puzzle, you know? Yeah, thank you. Great. Thanks, Adam. Um, we have a couple of questions in the chat, but before I get to that, I just wanted to ask about international students and um, their requirements for um, entry to the program. Um, I know um, you've mentioned earlier in the call that someone would need a 2-1 or 2-2 two two as a, 
as a minimum entry requirement to to the programs. Um, do you have any advice for international students on their entry requirements? Is it do they need an equivalent to enter? Yeah, so I think UL Global then kind of translate theirs. I the name is fleeting on me. That translates basically. So when we get it, you uh, submit your transcript as they are, and then. Um, Sorry, maybe you remember that we, it gets translated into, OK, this so, is the equivalent so of this degree. We, yeah, we, we have a benchmarking process that is carried out by our international office. So really, the only way to find out whether you qualify is to is to either communicate with our international office or actually submit your application. In fact, I think that's the best way to do this is submit your application. It gets benchmarked and that benchmark then is transmitted to Moran, who along with other bits and pieces will assess the application on on uh, on that basis. Um, so really, you are looking for the equivalent of a a two one probably for our international our international market, and it also depends on the university that you attend. So it's 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 complex in terms of the internal map your transcripts where you've where you've studied etc and and then our international office will benchmark that and, and the the equivalent to to Moran who can then make a decision along with the other bits and pieces um and then uh, of course there's a language requirement as well Laura there's a language requirement as well and um, yes. that standardized language requirement is available on our on our website under the mm -hmm. the link that I that I posted earlier yeah, um, thanks, Virgil. And actually, I had uh, we had some very specific questions about um, personal entry requirements for um, I think someone with a US um, a US qualification. And our admissions team um, confirmed that the minimum entry requirements GPA of three out of four is you know the the equivalent for that person who answered that question. So I'll just drop that into the chat. Um, and, just, and just to clarify, Laura, it, it will vary. It will vary across universities. So that specific question, you were able to get an answer for that. But in some universities, it could be higher. It could be lower, depending on the benchmark process. OK, OK. Um, I what I have done there, so is I've dropped in the um, international at ul.ie address and you can contact any of our colleagues in the international office who will be able to to make that equivalent for you um, in relation to your own particular institution. Um, with regard to English language requirements, I just want to go through one more question. Somebody who is undertaking their undergraduate degree at a UK university, but is an international student there, they wanted to know about their um, their entry requirements as regards English language. And the confirmation was that if you have at least two years study at an international university that you you can qualify for English language requirements. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. Um, I wanted to move on then um, to um, international students um, again, just while we're here, uh, roughly what percentage of international students would be on uh, on this program? So it does vary year by year. This year we have. Um, about five out of. I think our current year is about 20. 24 maybe so five out of them are international. So it, I would say that's quite representative. Yes, and we have okay. you know we have students from from the US. We have students from India, um, Europe. So it's a very nice mix of internationals yeah. there, which really then adds you know that global context that is so important today. Absolutely, and you know it probably mirrors the um, the UL. Um, international population, you know, we have about 20% global students um, at the university, so um, that of course reflects that well. Um, I think we have a great, you know, for our international students, there's a great community, a lot of activities that are done with our international students. And I think, you know, there's there's lots of going on in there that UL Global really does a great job with creating a community for those people coming into Ireland for to study. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Hopefully uh, we might have a global student on the call the next time uh, to share their experience on the program. Yeah. 
Um, Fergal, another one for you on um, admissions and uh, application assessment, um, not just for this course, I suppose, but um, it's, it, the requirement to enter any programme, obviously, is to um, send your supporting documents, you know, your, your results to date um, and possibly a personal statement. How else is their application um, assessed by the team at, at KBS? Uh, again, there's there's no uh, straightforward one size fits all. Uh, I think Moran's course is particularly structured in terms of how they um, review their applications uh, with good reason because of their accreditation, etc. They they have a rubric and quite a, quite a, a stringent process in terms of the the application. So they have a weighting attached to to various aspects of the um, of the application material. Some courses uh, just require transcripts and the course director is happy to make an assessment based on transcripts. Um, in my particular course, which would be business analytics, I put a lot of weight on the CV. I like to see what people have done, what their um, competencies are, uh, what particular skills they have. And I might refer to the transcript as well, but I've got an overall summary from that from UL Global anyway. So I, I get a sense of that. Uh, finally, uh, I personally, again, and it varies from course to course, I am somewhat very uh, wary of personal statements, particularly ones that talk about from the moment I was born, I wanted to study at the University of Limerick. You need to be much more focused in terms of why this fits in with your career plan, what you enjoyed in your undergraduate studies that has that has brought you to considering this course and make it quite factual and I, I think course directors really appreciate that as opposed to the softer uh, dreamy type stuff that may very well be true but it doesn't resonate as well as the kind of I was studying business and I took some HR modules and I fell in love with HR and you can see from my transcript that my HR grades are much superior to my let's say finance grade and that that tells a better story um, so again, what, what we look at varies, but what I would emphasize is on the particular course page, which I posted earlier for work in OB and OP, the application requirements are, are stated there. And what's really helpful to get your application reviewed very, relatively quickly is that you, you submit all of those at the time of application. It really helps more and, and it helps colleagues in GPS as well. Just a couple of ones while I have the floor, Laura. Um, there is a question from Soraya, which asks about whether the course is accredited by the Irish Higher Education Ministry. Yes is the answer to that. I'm going to say that with 99.9% .9 certainty, but Soraya, you can look that up as well. And Leonardo, I think really in terms of reputation, I'll let Moran come in around this in terms of the accreditation, but just again, going back to the business school in terms of it being triple accredited. I mean, there, there are three quality stamps that put us in the one, top 1% 1 of business schools in the world. And we, we keep referring to that because it's hugely important to us. And I let Moran talk about maybe how the course is accredited and why that gives us a bit more kudos than unaccredited courses. Yes, yeah, so I'll start with that and I'll go back to the um, admissions question. So, yeah, we're accredited. Obviously, UL is accredited generally and we're accredited by um, the PSI Psychological Society of Ireland and CIPD, who is the Irish body of, um, of like HR would go under that. So if you're from the US, um, SHRM is the equivalent for that. So we've been we've just gone through accreditation of both and got them renewed with great assessment and evaluation. So we're accredited. We definitely have a reputation. You know, in Ireland, there are only three accredited um, graduate programs for work in organizational psychology, um, ourselves, um, DCU and Cork, and definitely well known. Um, our graduates, you know, we have American graduates, so probably, you know, might not have been known as well as the Ameri some of American universities like Ohio State, for example, which would be well known throughout. But definitely, I think, like Adam said, you, having the degree and, you know, then coming and bringing this is all the things that I have learned and done in my degree, um, I think lends you that credibility. And, you know, obviously it is accredited and recognized across the world. Saying that's about the accreditation, I'll just add to what Fergal said in terms of the uh, admissions process. So we don't do personal statement exactly for the reasons that Fergal mentioned. We do have our competency form, which is very specific. We want you to outline your experience and reflect on that experience for very specific areas. Um, 
and we have a very, very specific rubric. And what we look at is, you know, how you reflect about your experience, your experience. So, you know, if you have been doing HR or related jobs for 10 years and maybe you have a lower award in your degree, but you have an experience um, that's not mandatory. So if you're right out of graduate school and you've done student jobs, that's that's great as well. That's a job experience. And if you can use everything you've learned about psychology to reflect on that as we outline, then this is what we're looking for. So what your degree is in um, goes into the calculation, your award in the degree, any experience, any kind of other educational experience, any certificates or anything that you've done. And then that competency form, which means um, I would say, pay, you know, work on that. Show us what you know. Show us. It doesn't matter if you've done a lot of group work, if you've worked for many years or not. What we want to see is how you think about and reflect about those experiences. And like Farewell said, when you apply, make sure you have everything. We don't review applications that are missing any documents so that would delay your our review of your application. So make sure you have it all ready and pull it out. I think that was all we had, all the questions I needed to answer until now. I think we have some more, right, Laura? I, I do. I have some more for you, Moran. Um, it's someone who is working in, um, uh, who has a mid senior level HR career. Um, would this be a good course for them to pursue to um, to maybe switch up their career options or, you know, uh, advance their seniority? Yeah, absolutely. I think, like Adam said, we, you are going to get a very broad kind of view and education in these different areas and you will get the kind of professional network. So I think it definitely gives you bring in your HR experience, which is valuable, very important, and you would complement it. So in terms of what you learn, and then also, again, that degree that is a bit more general than HR and the professional network that you will gain through the course, um, I think are very helpful in terms of changing up, maybe changing course a little bit, uh, going up for more senior positions. I think absolutely. Great. Um, thanks for that. Um, I know there's another one down here. Um, on on, um, on the awards that people um, will get, um, if someone like uh, Melissa from a HR background wants to apply, are they applying to um, the psychology um, element of the programme or are they um, applying to the um, organisation behaviour yeah. element? program it's behavior because they don't come with psychology well, if, if, you, they don't. if you have an undergraduate degree an honors undergraduate degree in psychology then you can apply for the psychology track now if you don't have that if you have you know your undergraduate degrees in business sociology or really anything you know any kind then you would apply for the behavior so any kind of related field is helpful but we definitely have you know students that are coming in with background from philosophy, they did undergraduate in philosophy, gender studies. So we do have a quite a wide variety that I think, again, enriches right, our discussions and how we think about things. Excellent. And so that probably answers the question um, from another attendee who's asked, is it a suitable course, a transition course, if your background, if your background is in a different field? So you mentioned obviously the range of, of options that people have come from in the past. Yeah. Yeah, so behavior would be, and I will say, so if you do not have a level eight degree for your undergraduate degree, we do have a, a track of um, recognition of prior learning. So you kind of, if, you know, if you've been working for a few years in related areas, so you could apply through there. So if you do not have that level eight degree, you'll get in touch with us so we can give you some guidance on what can be done. Um, that's great, Moran, and that information is also available um, through a link on the course page. So again, we'll share those um, with everybody on the call as well. Um, somebody else has asked for information on, on scholarships. I've just put a link into the chat there on fees, funding and scholarships. There's there's some, some information there um, for you. Um, if there are scholarships available at the Kemi Business School. That's where you'll find information on it. We don't have anything particularly for this program um, at present. Am I right in saying it's, that? Yeah, that, that, that's true at the moment, but keep an eye on our website because yes. any opportunities would normally be released later in the recruitment season. And just to add one thing on that, uh, UL Global actually have a number of scholarships that are automatically applied for international applicants. 
um, but the UL Global um, decide on that, particularly based on the strength of the, the application. So again, it would be good to have a conversation with UL Global in terms of your application and the likelihood that a, a scholarship of any description would be attached to that. And those scholarships generally tend to be 10, 15, 20 percent of the of the course fee, but they are not available to apply for. They are they are um, applied at the offer stage as part of UL Global's operation. Um, yeah, so Great. keep an eye on our website and look for scholarships in the new year if there if there are some available. Yeah, um, and I think I'll I'll drop some uh, details in for international students as well um, about exploring some options that may be available um, at that end. Um, Fergal, at the start of this call, you spoke about the advantages of, of graduates going straight into um, a master's program. Um, I one of the um, attendees here has asked, um, you know, what are the advantages? I, I think maybe they might have missed the start, but it might be worth repeating, you know. Um, sure. Yeah. About and the progression I straight noticed, from the grad. I, I noticed, um, I think it's uh, Leonardo has asked mm -hmm. again around the mix more on uh, yeah. with respect to um, undergrads going straight on and returners. So just very, very briefly, the first thing I would say about pursuing a postgraduate qualification is that there is there's quite a bit of research that shows it results in significantly increased earnings power across your career. So um, that's the Adam talked about that in terms of it being viewed as an investment. And I'd agree agree on that, that it's an investment that should pay off. And in fact, the majority of time does pay off across your career. Uh, the advantages of doing it straight out of your undergrad or shortly after your undergrad is generally undergrads come out at 21, 22, 23 years of age. They are footloose and fancy free for want of a better expression, and they have very little in terms of ties, responsibilities, etc. If they are lucky enough to be in a position to continue their studies, financially particularly, it is a good time to get your master's qualification because you're in the study mode if you're remaining at your own university, you understand how that university works and you're hitting the ground running, you're familiar with the system, you're familiar with the structure, you're familiar with the, the beat of that university. So I think that's that's the main advantage. Other people will argue, and there's no right or wrong answer, other people will argue that you're better off going out and experiencing work and figuring out what you'd like. So let's call that a three to five year journey in terms of maybe doing one, two or three different jobs and then saying I like X, I want to go back and study more. But at that point in time, you're likely to have a different lifestyle. You may or may not have ties that prevent you from returning. You will have to forego possibly uh, work in order to return, particularly if you want to go back full time. Or you will have to genuinely make sacrifices if you're going back on a part time basis because it eats into your discretionary time, whatever that involves. Um, and it's each to their own on that. I mean, I, I couldn't say what what I would do or what somebody else should do. I'd have to I'd have to assess it. My own personal view is, as I said earlier, is if it's if it's convenient and if you have the resources, um, I think it's a good idea. And I say this in the nicest possible way to get it out of the way as part of your as part of your journey towards master's education. Yes, yeah, so just in terms of the course, you know, we we have students at all these stages that Fergal described. We have students that directly, you know, um, enroll into the program while they're in their last year of their undergraduate degree and start it immediately after. We have people who may have been out for a year or two and come back and we have year, people that are coming back many years later. So we have representation of everybody and you will find whatever stage you are in your life, you will find there's at least one more person, if not more, that will be in a similar stage to yourself. Uh, that's great, Maram, because we just had uh, another question from someone who's got 20 year, 27 years industry experience. But I think over the call, we've learned that there's such a good mix of, of people yeah. with varying levels of, of experience on the programme that um, they will find someone on the programme with similar experience. And then just one last question, because I'm, I'm just uh, very conscious of time. And uh, maybe this is a question to both of you. Um, 
when somebody finishes the MSc um, in in work in organizational behavior or psychology, what research options are open to them to progress even further at the university or other universities, I guess? We have a great or PhD program. PhD, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we have a great PhD program and I think that all of our PhD students, we have a good amount of PhD students who are studying great many different things. I think all of them are graduates of our program, so you know they enjoy it that much and they enjoy the research route, so they stick around and we're very happy to have them stay. Um, you know, then go into different academic positions or in industry. Um, we have part time um, PhD students as well. So there definitely are research is part of the program, so you're going to have to do a master's research thesis as a part of, of the program. Um, so yeah, definitely there are a lot of research options. And as I said, we're all active researchers, so we very much enjoy talking to our students about research. And get, you know, finding opportunities. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, again, I'm going to drop um, some research opportunities into the chat as well when I have a minute. Um, while I do that, Moran, maybe you'd like to just close out the session for today. Um, I will be online chatting for a little while longer if you want to drop a chat in, but I'll let you um, close out formally, I suppose, on this occasion. Yeah, so thank you everybody for joining um, and, and coming in. It's great to be able to kind of share a bit about the program, about the university and you know, hear your questions. Um, hopefully I'll be seeing your applications coming in by the 20, the 31st of January. Uh, and again, if you have any questions, we'll stay here and there's our email address at wapob at ul.ie that any question or any query, just feel free to email us. And yeah, we'd love to chat more and answer any questions. Thank you, Adam, for joining us and uh, Laura and Eve and Fergal for joining and contributing from your experience and knowledge of, you know, the university and the program. Yeah, thanks all. Thanks all.